Hello. <clears throat> Thank you for joining. I'm Jean-Ansoir Puget from uh, IBM, and I will discuss machine learning competitions. So I'm Jean-Ansoir Puget from IBM, um, but for what matters today, I'm active on Kaggle, which is a machine learning competition platform, and I'm known as CPMP there. Um, so, um, why are we interested in machine learning competition at all? Isn't it a bit uh, uh, specific and uh, a game and not serious? Yes, it is fun. It is a game. It's very addictive. Uh, I even say that Kaggle is a legal drug. You can really spend a lot of time on it. But why is it interesting from a, a business point of view or a work point of view? First, as a data scientist or machine learning practitioner, if you enter a Kaggle competition, you will get feedback on how you fare compared to state-of-the-art practice. So you get unbiased feedback on how, how good you are at building good machine learning models. And this can be unpleasant. Uh, I, re I remember my first competition was a wake-up call. My practice of machine learning was nowhere near uh, where I thought it was. But I learned. Um, and if you go there, you will learn as well. You learn because you get uh, access to the best data scientists in the world. You can exchange with them. You can learn from what they share. You can learn best practice, you can learn about tools. Um, so this is a, a great source for learning. It's not the only one, but it's a great source to learn the practice. Uh, even more important, what you learn uh, while competing can be reused on real world machine learning projects. Uh, if you learn how to do data exploration, how to do feature engineering, how to tune models, how to evaluate models, all these skills are reusable in real-world machine learning uh, problems. But, and this is important, real-world machine learning requires way more than these skills. In real-world, uh, you need first to identify an opportunity to use machine learning an opportunity that makes sense from a business point of view or, or from some uh, utility uh, measure um, that your uh, environment has. So find a way to apply machine learning to improve or solve a business problem is it's, it's in itself a skill. And then once you have identified the problem, you need to gather data for uh, solving that problem. You need to gather ground truths or labels for the data to uh, use supervised machine learning, which is uh, what works today. Um, and then you need to be able to convey uh, the results, the, the models you have back to business users and stakeholders. So real world machine learning requires communication skills and uh, data engineering skills. Um, that are not exercised on Kaggle or other platforms. Because on Kaggle, you're, you get a data set and a well-defined machine learning problem. So part of the job has been done for you. So again, on Kaggle, you will exercise very interesting skills, useful in real world, but you don't exercise all skills. So now let's look a bit at uh, uh, what why Kaggle. Um, First, uh, there are few alternatives, at least in Western countries. Um, there are some like Numer AI, but it's really focused on uh, predicting some uh, uh, equity price. There are few would be competition, but uh, uh, Kaggle is really without an equivalent, at least in Western countries. In China, there are a dozen of Kaggle like comp uh, competition platform like Tianxi and others. Um, but access, if you're not uh, a native speaker, is a bit, uh, a bit difficult. So unless you're from China, uh, Kaggle is probably uh, the most interesting platform. And for that reason, 
it attracts your best data scientists. Uh, and it's a uh, it's, uh, virtuous, cir virtuous circle. The best data scientists go to Kegel and they attract more data scientists who want to compete and learn. So it's a network effect. And as a real consequence, being, uh, having a top rank at Kegel is recognized in the industry. If you're a Kegel Grandmaster, uh, it means something and uh, it is recognized. Um, and for, uh, for, for my point of view, which is to learn useful skills that I can apply in my work, uh, the methodology enforced by Kaggle is similar to what people should do in real-world machine learning, is a clear cut between training data and validation data. So not only you learn useful skills, but you also learn a good methodology. Uh, there are some downsides for Kaggle. Uh, first, it is uh, now part of Google. So it is run a bit independently, but still some people have fear uh, of sharing data with Google. So uh, this may hurt uh, Kaggle. There, there are also, um, I didn't mention it, but Kaggle competition come with money prize often. Uh, I didn't say it's a good reason to go there because uh, it's unlikely you get a prize. It's only the top three or top five people in a competition, but because uh, there's a prize, it means some company is paying Kaggle to run a competition and also uh, to get prize money for participants. And in return, you have some legal terms you must agree with. In general, they are not really an issue, but in some competitions like Zillow, uh, the legal binding can be very strong and frightening and uh, I believe it was uh, contradicting with my job employment at IBM, for instance. And even if it was not, I would not uh, enter Zillow because in a nutshell, everything you did uh, was belonging to Zillow even if you don't get a prize, which I find totally unacceptable. But this is an exception. Uh, the usual rules for competitions are perfectly fine. Unless you get a prize, you're not forced to share anything and you keep IP of uh, uh, the, the intellectual property of what you do. So, but read the fine print in the rules still uh, in case there is an issue. So, uh, now we're done with legal, we're done with real, real world machine learning. Let's focus on machine learning competitions. So, how is, uh, is it structured? You're given a, a data set, um, which is one or several files, CSV files, or uh, other format when it is sound or images, when well, you have a data set. And this data set is split between a training part and a test part. And you're supposed to build models out of the training data set, use uh, models to make predictions on the test data set, and then those predictions are evaluated by Kaggle. And you get feedback on your prediction quality. And the goal is to get the best possible prediction on the test data set. Uh, to make it a bit more um, reliable, Kaggle further splits the test data set into a public one and a private one. And in fact, you get the feedback on your prediction on the public part of the of the test data set. It's a bit abstract, I would give an example. Uh, why are they doing so? Because each time you get feedback, so when you train a model and you evaluate it on your training data, you're getting feedback. Or when you submit prediction on a test data set and you get a score, you get feedback. And it is tempting to use this feedback to select your models. As a result, you tend to build models that may behave very well on the public score part of the test data set. This is called overfitting. And in order to avoid it, the final evaluation is made on data you don't know, uh, for which you got no feedback. 
because the goal of machine learning is to build models that can make good prediction on unknown data. That's uh, the crux of machine learning. So that's why Kaggle tried to find a setting which is as close as possible to it with this private data set. So let's see how it uh, looks in, in practice. So I think this is extracted from a Kaggle competition. I don't remember which one. So you have a data set. So this one here is a small sample. Uh, usually you have between several thousand and several hundred million uh, rows. Um, my last competition talking data was 280 million rows. So data set can be uh, con uh, consistent. Uh, so you have features um, and you have a target, which is a return on investment, I believe. Um, and these are probably stock in, in a market. And you have some, uh, here you have the industry area. Well, I don't remember, I, I don't know this competition, so I'm just guessing. But the point is you have a data set where you'll give um, a set of examples. Each row is an example. Each example has a set of features. Here you see four. Uh, the number of features can be larger, up to thousands, depending on the competition. And what you're asked to do is to build a model that from an example feature predicts the target. Here, uh, a return. Um, so you need to build a model that uh, take, given the values for one example, makes a prediction of the target. And then you want a good model. So you want your prediction to be as close as possible to the target. And this closeness is measured by some metric like uh, accuracy, if it's classification or mean square or if it's uh, a regression like this, predicting a numerical value. So that's the data set. But if I'm asking you to find the best model, well, you just return the target and you're done. You have a perfect model, and, but you've not learned anything. So that's why there is a test and a trend split. So what Kegel does and what everybody should do in machine learning is to set apart some of the data to validate models. And uh, only train model on the remain, uh, remaining data. So this is how it would be done here on this small data set uh, by Kaggle. So they would take, say, about one third of the data. Sorry, I've put train twice. Um, sorry, sorry. So the bottom piece should be test data set. I'm sorry. Uh, and you see the difference between the trend and test in that you're not given, Kegel knows, but me as a participant, I don't know the target for the test. And that's uh, normal. I build a model that predicts the return out of the features, and I need to predict the return on the test data. If I knew the target for the test data, it would be tempting to just give that. This way, not knowing the, the target for the test data makes sure that uh, we evaluate the model in an unbiased uh, way. So again, this, uh, this methodology, trend test split, is the basis of machine learning. Everybody should do it. Yet, I keep seeing people who evaluate their model on the training data, which is a really a bad idea. Then, what Kegel does, it further splits the test data into train into a public score and a private score data. And each time you submit, so you submit values that your model computes uh, for the test uh, data, it will give you the accuracy or the error, depending on, on the metric used, on some of the test data, the blue part. So the test data is split between public and private. You don't know the split. As a participant, you don't know the split. Uh, and you get feedback on, uh, on your predictions. So th this way, even if you tune your model to be good on the public score, 
if your model is not really learning something uh, useful, if it is not generalizing properly, it will behave badly on the yellow pieces. So that's why uh, uh, Hegel decided to have this private score. And you know the private score only at the end of the competition. And this is how ranking are updates. So in a nutshell, that's a, a competition. And uh, I think uh, this way of using uh, train and test data should be applied, could be applied in real world machine learning. And that's why I always tell people who want to start machine learning to not give all the data to the data scientist, to keep some of the data as a Kaggle, to keep secret some of the targets so that data scientists are not tempted to use those secret values and you can evaluate their model in an unbiased way. Uh, last point, uh, each time you submit uh, your answers, your model answers to the unknown values, you get a score, and then there is a leaderboard. Um, so each competition comes with a metric, could be accuracy, uh, or F1 score, or work curve for classification, could be root mean square error, or mean average error for regression problems, um, or their metrics depending on the, on the problem at hand, and you have uh, a leaderboard that looks like this. Uh, and at the end uh, of, uh, of the competition, you can see the private leaderboard. So this is a private leaderboard of uh, one competition where I finished second. So that's me here, uh, 10 months ago. Um, this leads to uh, just a quick intro about me. So I'm currently, the number one here you know, because I, I write easily in Kaggle forum. On competition, it's a bit harder. I'm 34, which is not so bad, but it's easier at least for me to, to speak than to do. Um, and what did I do? So I, I learned a, a few stuff uh, while I was competing. So these are the highlights, and then I will go through my methodology. Um, the first thing is uh, I competed, I started competing a bit more than two years ago. And in my first competition, I was on the public leaderboard. I was about uh, 600 um, on the public leaderboard out of 5,000. So almost in the top 10 percent. I was very happy. I said, oh, it's not that hard. Uh, with a little practice, I will be uh, top, etc." And I dropped to 1,100 in the private leaderboard, which was way less um, impressive. And more important, I dropped. This drop means I was building models that look good on the data I could have access to, the training data and the public test data, but my model was performing uh, uh, worse on new data. And this is something you don't want to see happening in machine learning. So to me, the crux of machine learning is to be able to build models that perform well on you know, unknown data. And it's not just to me, it's, it's for everybody. And so I have learned in two years how to avoid you know, some tricks to avoid this drop. Um, each time you drop like this, it means you made a mistake. You build a model that you thought was good and that was way worse in fact. And I think being uh, able to evaluate properly your model strengths is the most important skill in machine learning practice. That's what distinguishes a good data scientist from a dangerous one. A good one will be able to evaluate a model using the training data and, and have a good idea of the performance of the model on uh, new future data. The dangerous data scientist is someone who will produce a model that looks great on the training data, 
and that performs very poorly on new data. Um, and the difference is a thing between a good and a dangerous one. All right, so what I did uh, on Kaggle, um, so Kaggle, you get medals uh, if you, you fare well in a competition. So the top 1% also gets a gold medal, then the top 3, 4% a silver, and top 10 uh, a bronze, roughly. And I got four gold medals so far. Once, my first one, I was teaming with three uh, people uh, that I met on Kaggle. One of them being a friend now, uh, you can see. Uh, and we finished 12. It was a first for all of us. And the lesson I got from this was to never give up. Until the last day, we were not in gold. We were like 18th. And at 2 a.m. the last day, uh, Ifan and me, we found some... Uh, some additional features that we added to our model and that moved us uh, five ranks. And we came as a surprise uh, among the gold guys. So never give up until the last minute in every competition and uh, in every project. Until the deadline, you can do something. As long as the deadline is not over, you can always improve. So that's true in Kaggle, that's true in life in general. Then uh, last summer, I did uh, uh, web traffic forecasting. Uh, so it was to forecast Wikipedia uh, page traffic. We were given uh, past two years of, tra of, of visit number per day for about 150K uh, Wikipedia pages, and we were asked to forecast the next two months. And uh, I was using my favorite algorithm, XGBoost, and uh, some guys were passing me on the leaderboard. They were performing uh, way better. So I decided to try deep learning. Uh, so that's how I, I learned deep learning. I just tried it on this competition and, uh, and finished well a uh, second. Um, and then I learned about other people who use uh, uh, way uh, with better deep learning models uh, along the way. Um, in another competition, Favorita, which was also forecasting, uh, we were, um, I was teaming uh, with another friend and we never were in gold position, but we didn't care. We were just evaluating our models uh, and we were explaining why, explain why, how, and we didn't care about the leaderboard. So we were not looking good at the leaderboard and the public leaderboard, but on the private leaderboard. So everybody in front of us almost dropped and we finished uh, uh, well. So don't, don't use the leaderboard. Don't use the feedback on test data. Um, then I had a bad story uh, in the 11, in uh, another uh, competition where we, it was a, a sentiment analysis. So Detecting uh, uh, toxic comments in uh, in uh, social uh, net in so social media, so it was natural language understanding. I was I teamed with uh, the same friend and another guy. We finished in gold, and then we were removed because the third person uh, did not comply with Kaggle rules, and we were just removed uh, and eliminated. So if you go on Kaggle, beware with whom to you uh, team. You can team, but teaming with someone you don't know may be a bit dangerous. Um, and the last competition I did well as well. Um, same story. Never give up. I moved uh, like 10 ranks the last day. Um, so this is just my history. Uh, if you come, if you enter, I'm sure you will have interesting history within two years. Um, so, what are the main lessons? The first thing is, Kaggle comes with rules. You don't want to mess with the rules. Um, I say it again. This was really bad uh, for me. Uh, I was suspected of cheating, like every member of the team, until. Uh, as the third guy said it was him, it's not a present account. 
Uh, and uh, so the rule he broke is simple. He was using more than one account. So he opened several accounts. Uh, and why, uh, why are people tempting to do this? To limit overfitting, Kaggle limits the number of uh, submissions one can make every day, typically five per competition. But each time you make a uh, submission, you get feedback from uh, the test data. And uh, there are techniques to, trans to transform this into really useful information for training your models. It's called the uh, leaderboard probing. And uh, so in this competition, when we teamed, uh, I had used like 20 submissions. And the other guy with several accounts and more time had used 500 submissions. With 500 submissions, you get a lot of useful data and you can build better models. So Kaggle uh, is fighting this by limiting the number of uh, submissions per day and are tracking who use more than one account. The other thing that uh, is forbidden is to communicate the, uh, information or data outside teams. Uh, if you want to exchange with someone about a competition, you should team. And teaming is interesting because you learn from the other person you team with. All right, so that's uh, uh, the general settings. So now uh, let me go through a bit of my workflow. That's how I approach a competition. First, I do some exploratory data analysis, um, EDA. Then I create a model, a simple one that I use to submit. Uh, it has two purposes. First, uh, I check very quickly that I understand the competition correctly and that I'm submitting something meaningful. And second, it's a baseline uh, from which I build. Once you have a baseline, you, comp you build new models. And if they look better uh, locally on your data, then you submit. And hopefully, they should be better on the leaderboard. And to be able to do this, you need to be able to evaluate your models. Uh, and for this, I, I use cross-validation, like most people. And this is where I spent a lot, a lot of time, making sure I have a reliable cross-validation setting. I will show some examples. Once you have a good cross-validation setting, it means that uh, you can evaluate your models properly. And uh, if a model is better on your cross validation, then it will probably be better on the leaderboard. And then you can just forget about the leaderboard. You work with your local data as much as possible. And then what you do, uh, the other uh, place where I spend a lot of time is feature engineering. So we show some uh, examples. Um, and then you can do a bit of algorithm tuning. It's called hyperparameter optimization, HPO, but not much. And uh, beginners, and I remember that's what I did in my first competitions, are spending way too much time in tuning algorithms and not enough time doing feature engineering. And last, um, all, all of this is useful for real-world machine learning. For Kaggle, if you want the last twist that can move you from, say, a bronze medal to gold, if you want to really scrap uh, the last few percent of uh, accuracy or, or whatever you're measuring, you need to use something called ensembling, which is a way to use together several models. So, uh, Ensembling is not much used in real-world machine learning because it results in uh, way more complex machine learning models, but it's coming, it's coming. We begin to see demand from customers on, uh, on supporting ensembling out of the box in, uh, in uh, our machine learning platform. All right, so EDA. 
So um, I spend a lot of time. And the goal of exploratory data analysis is not to produce nice looking pictures, which unfortunately most people believe it is. Um, the goal of uh, EDA is to uncover patterns that could be useful for your models. So I'm giving two examples. Um, this one, so the talking data competition, we were asked to predict if people will download some mobile app. So we were given uh, 280 million clicks uh, data from China. Talking Data is a, is a China mobile company. And uh, so for each click, we had the time, we had which ad. So people were clicking on ads. And then we were uh, asked to predict if they would download the corresponding app. So we, we didn't know which app it was. We didn't know which ad it was. They were anonymized. So for each click, we had an app number, a channel number. So channel could be, I don't know, YouTube or uh, another site. The app could be any app on, uh, on your uh, mobile store, etc. So we had five or six features, and that's it. It was a challenging because we had so little feature and that uh, we had to look at uh, various ways uh, to look at the data. And here is one. Uh, we also had an ID, which was uh, an encrypted version or well, a hash version of the IP address. So in Western country, it would, the ID would be more or less equal to a device, to a mobile phone or uh, uh, a laptop. In China, it's a bit more complex because uh, there is a shortage of IP address. So often people are on a local network and uh, several users go out to internet using the same IP uh, yeah, proxy. So anyway, and uh, sometimes the IP contains information. Uh, the data preparation is such that uh, there is a leak, the IP may not be neutral. It should, but it's not. And in talking data, I just computed. I sorted the data by IP number and then computed an average, uh, a moving average of download rates. And we see that, so this is really close to zero. Uh, this was like, 0.2% and this was like, no, 2% and this was like 20%. So IPs until, well, IDs until this value were not downloading much. And then these new, these additional IDs had a much greater probability of uploading, of downloading uh, an application. When you have something like this, a 10X, increase in some uh, feature, then you find something. You can build a feature out of it. You can try those stuff. So EDA is for that. My graphic is not fancy. It's just Matplotlib in Python, but it has some interesting info. I shared it. Actually, this turned out to not be exploitable. Uh, this, uh, um, well, there was other ways to capture and use that info. It happened that the IDs were given by uh, the time at which the first time when people uh, were connected to clicking with, on one of the ads tracked by token data. So these were new people every day, and new people have a tendency to, tendency to download more than uh, usual people. But there was other ways to capture that. Anyway, this was a quite predictive pattern. Here is another example. This was on another competition. Two Sigma rental, a very interesting one. Uh, if you want to learn about feature engineering and encourage people to just look at Kaggle, so it's a past competition, and look for this competition, 
the idea was to evaluate the interest generated by rent ad in New York area, in New York City area. So we were given uh, a number of ads. So an ad comes with text, uh, location of the apartment or, or house to be uh, rented, some pictures um, per ad, and uh, for the training data, we were given an interest uh, uh, ratio between one, two, or three. And the goal was to classify the test data as, as one, two, or three uh, interests. And in fact, there was a leak uh, in this data set based on uh, the time at which uh, the timestamp of the picture. So here is how I visualize the leak. I didn't find it. I was not the first to find it, but I found this way to visualize it. So on the y-axis, you have the ID of the pictures. No, yeah, ID of the picture. On the x-axis, you have the time at which the picture was created. And the color coding is the target. So I don't remember which is one, which is which, but I believe blue is one. Usually, uh, uh, cold colors are low values. So blue is one, green is two, and red is three. And you see, if this was random, then you should have the color spread evenly. But here you see there is a zone where this is all blue, mostly blue, and this is not blue and same here at the top it's all blue almost well adding the timestamp of the picture was greatly improving the uh, machine learning model accuracy so this is useful to win or, or to perform better in the competition in the real world it's if you ever find something like this it's called a leak it means that your data preparation was wrong because you introduce a, a feature. Obviously, they uploaded this set of uh, good interest uh, ads, not at the same time as these bad interest uh, ads. So it means that in the data preparation, in the way you sample data, you introduce some information that should not be there. So being able to detect leaks is also interesting because it happens very easily. It happens very easily that you prepare in your training data in your real world machine learning and you find very good models, but in fact, your models are good because you encoded somehow what you want to predict in the data. That's really so. First, being aware that leaks can happen, and second, being able to detect them is very useful uh, to train real-world models because you don't want to train them on a data set that have leaks. But that's how I see uh, exploratory data analysis. Find ways to show graphically patterns. Why graphically? Because the AI is the best data analysis tool ever so far. The AI and the human brain uh, would be. So if you find ways to show your data uh, in an interesting way, your brain will pick some patterns like this or this one. And then you can code them as feature. All right, um, baseline submission. The goal is to have something to submit as quickly as possible. Uh, and I usually start with something simple. So for instance, if you have a classification problem, just use logistic regression. Uh, if you have a regression problem, why not use a linear regression? Why? Because these models are quick to build and you can have an idea of how complex your problem is. And, the, and I'm serious in the, in the Wikipedia forecast, 
I took the first place on the leaderboard for one week duration with a linear regression model when everybody was using deep learning and that and blah, blah. And I was uh, uh, at the top with a linear regression for one week. Well, then people make progress, but so start simple. And then once you have a working model, you can try something more complex like gradient boosted machines uh, XGBoost or IGBM or deep learning. But don't start with complex models necessarily. Also, um, so starting from the baseline, you can try more complex algorithm and also you can add features. And each time you do something new, like a new feature, you evaluate. If it is better, you keep it. If it's not, you drop it. Same for your new algorithm. If it performs better, you keep it. If not, you drop it. So cross-validation, that's your crux. Remember, uh, like any machine learning, we are building models on training data. And the goal is to get good predictions on test data. And we should not look at test data too much. Otherwise, we overfit, and it's not good on Kaggle, and it's not good in general. So we try not to look too much at the test data. Ideally, we should not look at it at all. So uh, this is very important. And uh, that's a mistake a lot of data scientists do, uh, at least when they start. For instance, in a competition called Porto Seguro, um, people were selecting their model based on their public score. And then people were sharing. So at some point, people, a lot of people were believing they had a very good model. And myself, I didn't look at the leaderboard. I just used my cross validation, my uh, local data. And the last day, I was almost at the 1200th rank on the public score out of 5,000. And on the private score, I was 29, quite close to the best score in, uh, in, in, uh, in metric use. So the difference between this rank and say the, the top five was very small. The top one was far away, but let's say top five, it was, so this was a good result. And people were surprised. They said, how did you jump? I didn't jump. It's all these other guys. They were badly overfitting and they dropped. Their model was not good on new data. Mine was good on new data, so it's fair well. So the right way is not to look at the test data at all, if possible. We use a trend data to validate models. And we use k-fold cross-validation. So if you don't know what cross-validation is, just Google it, learn about it. This is not the only way, but it's a very reliable way to evaluate your model. Basically, it takes the trend data and it splits it k times. That's why it's called k-fold as a train and test split, and it trains K model, and then it performs K validation, and then average. So I don't have time to, to go explain it here, but just learn about cross-validation. If you're not using cross-validation, I doubt you ever build a useful machine learning model. It's as simple as that. If your data is dependent on time, if, if you have a forecasting problem. So I don't say time series because in people's mind, often time series means time series models like uh, ARIMA. No, time, time series means you have a data that, depend, that, has, that have a, a time stamp. So if you, for instance, you predict uh, revenue for your stores for the next year, and you have a yearly revenue for the past five years, you have a time dependent data. Then cross validation should not be random. You should use basically, you should keep the last year, in my example, as your test data and the first four years to build your model. 
So if this is called time-based cross-validation, the way you split your data to do validation is based on time. Um, so learn about cross-validation. This is extremely important. Once you have cross-validation, usually you have a reasonable estimate of your model performance on new data. But there are tricks still. So this is from the talking data competition. So that's real uh, data. I had two models. And um, I ran cross-validation. So I don't remember, uh, maybe five-fold. And my first model, so trained five times on average, was having a 98% accuracy. I don't remember if or what was the measure. Let's see accuracy. I don't think it was accuracy, but let's see it's accuracy. Uh, and the other model was a bit less good. Uh, the difference is not big, you see it's, uh, but in that competition, this could mean uh, one or 200 rank difference because all models were pretty close. So you would select model one, right? Because it is the best one. Uh, in accuracy, higher is better. So what I do, and that's my first trick, um, well, no, when I submitted the two models, here is what I got. And this was disturbing because the model that is best locally is not best on the leaderboard. When this happens, it means you're in a really bad situation because you have no way to evaluate your models properly. You cannot trust your cross-validation because your cross-validation says model one is better than model two, but on the test data, it is a reverse. In that case, something is wrong. You cannot rely on your cross-validation, and really, I felt bad. So here is a trick I'm using. I've implemented my own uh, flavor of cross-validation where I measure the validation score on the, the validation fold, but I also measure the score on the training fold. And this is how it looks. So it means that my first model has a, a very high accuracy on its training data. You know, only 1% error. Whereas my model two has a lower accuracy, almost 2% error. And we see that the difference between the accuracy on the training data and the validation data for model two is 0.4%. Whereas the difference for model one is 1%. Well, in that case, I think this shows that this model is overfitting badly on the trend, performing well, because that's how I select it on the validation score, and performs badly on the leaderboard. And basically, if you drop a lot from the training to the validation, then you can expect a, a large drop from the validation to new data. Whereas if the drop here is small, then the drop here is small too. And this is, this is a rule of thumb, but I'm favoring when I have two models that are not so different, I look at their, and how they behave on, on their training data. And the one that, uh, that uh, overfits the most is, uh, is discarded. So in that case, if I look at these four numbers, I'm pretty sure the second model is better because I don't, I don't need to fit a lot on the training data to get uh, a fairly good uh, validation. So I'm always looking at the gap between train and validation. If the gap is large, it's an indication of overfitting. And uh, this, this seems to work quite well, uh, actually. Uh, I don't have a theoretical explanation for it. If someone has something, then I'd be interested. Uh, I may work with some research people to, to try to formalize this. 
if it's not done already. And then when I have a, a cross validation like this, each time I have a new feature ID or each time I tune an algorithm, I just run it. And this adds me another line with the training uh, score and the validation score. And if I see that even if I improve a bit my validation score, but I improve too much the accuracy, then I know I'm overfitting and I don't use the improvement. So as a conclusion, I try, when I try a new feature, if the cross validation is improving and the training score is improving, but not too much, then I keep it. Um, feature engineering. So that's where one should spend a lot of time. And there are two sources of features. One is to get features that make sense from a business point of view. So um, in talking data, the main idea was I found it while thinking. I say, why, if, I, if I'm a mobile user and I click on ads, once I downloaded an app, I don't click on ads for the same app, at least not immediately. So if I can detect in all the data, series of clicks from one user on some app data and then stop, then it's likely that the last click correspond to a download. So I encoded the last click in a series per user and per app and per channel. And this is the most useful feature in that competition. And a lot of, well, all top teams use that feature as a primary feature. So that's a, a business uh, related, when well, I say business, and that's uh, uh, related to the specifics of the data, of the problem you try to solve. Then there are uh, techniques to build features um, that work in general. For instance, you count, if you have a feature with a large number of values, you create a new feature, which is a count, the number, the frequency of each value. Uh, so values that happen often will have a higher count and values that happen less have a small, uh, a, a smaller number of counts. This is surprisingly effective, really, really surprisingly effective. And it's simple, you can do it every time you have this company. One is known as target encoding. It's related to information value for statisticians. Basically, uh, you, you compute the average of the target per value. So if you have a feature that has five different values, you compute the average target value for the first value, the, the average of the target value for the second value, etc., And you use this as a new feature. This is very, very predictive, so much that it often leads to overfitting. So you have to be careful, but um, this is really something very interesting. Then you can also use unsupervised learning like clustering. You can cluster your training data and use the cluster number or the centroid if you're using uh, k means as additional feature. Uh, for periodic data like hour in the day or minutes or days in week or they are periodic, but most algorithms well only understand numerical values. So uh, 23 hour is very far from zero hour when it should not. So in fact, you move your linear values on a circle and you take the sinus and cosinus. So for instance, if you have hours, you define x to be uh, two pi divided by 24, and then you take sinus and cosinus of x, and then you have two features so that uh, the features for the hour 24, 23 are close to the feature for the hour zero, which is what you want. If you have time series, you want to build features uh, 
that summarize the previous values, like average of the last week value or median of last week value, etc. So there are uh, techniques that you can apply on almost every problem, and there is a great uh, deck uh, describing this in full detail that you can download uh, if you, you you can get these slides and then you follow this. Link. Hyperparameter optimization. Don't spend too much with it. Second, only do it when you have a reliable cross-validation system. Otherwise, you would just overfit to your training data and then you're dead. Don't do it too much. This is a very good source of overfitting. So I usually do it after two or three weeks when I have a reasonable cross-validation setting and I start to have reasonable models. And then maybe I do it one or two weeks before and to grab a few extra uh, uh, percent in, uh, in the score, but that's it. If you do feature engineering each time, if you do cross um, hyperparameter tuning every day, then you never can compare your results. Uh, I use a lot, and not only me, uh, XGBoost and LightGBM, they are, uh, similar algorithm known as uh, gradient boosting machines. I use these settings, subsample of 0.7. Mean child weight, uh, it's a way to reduce overfitting. Then uh, depending for G boost or for like GBM, there is a parameter that controls the depth of your tree. And that's it. I don't tune much uh, other uh, feature algorithms. If you've never used this algorithm, it does not speak to you. But first, you should use this algorithm. They are state of the art for machine learning. They win you know, three competition out of four on Kaggle. The rest is deep learning. Last, uh, assembling. Don't start too early. So, assembling means uh merging several models so i start with uh, exibust or like gbm i add linear regression or logistic regression depending on the problem maybe some deep learning i use all folds and then take average that's extremely uh, useful and usually it improves over one model performance again i don't have time to describe in detail there is a great intro here um, if you follow the link. I'm running short of time, but uh, that's my last slide. Um, I try to practice every day, even if I'm traveling, if only 10 minutes. Uh, you don't need to sit in front of a machine all day. You need to prepare some experiments. Then after the experiment, you submit or you don't. But uh, so you, you can spend few, even few minutes in the morning to start an experiment and you look at it uh, at the evening. Try things. Uh, often people ask me, is it uh, useful to do this or that? Just do it, just try it. And personally, I like to share what I find and this is how I got uh, uh, Grandmaster. And here is my last slide. Uh, I'm a Python user. Some good Kagglers are our users, so I'm not saying Python is better than R, but that's what I'm using. I use scikit-learn, pandas, numba, which is a compiler, numpy, scipy, xgboost, lightgbn. These are my two favorite. For deep learning, I'm using Keras because it's very simple. I want to use PyTorch uh, because it's more flexible. Um, the rest I don't use uh, that much. For natural language processing, there is a wonderful package called Jensen. Uh, this one is really a gem. I en encourage people to use it. And that's, uh, that's it. So I don't know if there are questions or a chat. I can't see it. Uh, but you can reach me easily uh, on Kaggle or on Twitter. You saw my handle at the start. Yes, for competing, I have uh, a, buff, uh, a buff PC with two GPUs. 
uh, and they have an, uh, an older server, and they also have access to some IBM machines, more recent and more powerful. Um, but having a big machine is not told by any means. And uh, my first gold I won was a MacBook. So you can enter with small machines. Well, MacBook is not the smallest machine, but it's not a monster uh, by any means. Uh, I will stop here. Um, to me, the best, uh, the best interest of Kaggle is the feedback on one skill. So you can enter uh, with a pseudo. You don't need to give your full name if you want to be quiet and do your experiments and you disclose who you are only when you want. Last point, uh, we can continue this uh, if you have questions or you want to chat with me on this community we have here. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you all.